Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the TFD Performance Podcast. I am your host or co-host. I never know how it works, Geordie, when this is your podcast, but I'm the one always running the show because you always put me on the spot with these intros. And I feel like I really had a bit of a, like a plateau there for a while in terms of being thrown on the spot, but I feel like I'm back with a vengeance and, and I'm trying to get on top of it. But Geordie, welcome back. Today, we're going to be talking about training in the heat. Yeah, thanks, Oz. You definitely had a little um, performance rut there, but you pulled yourself out of it and you're coming back strong. And I think you, yeah, you reevaluated, you sat back and you changed a few key things in your camp and your preparation. And yeah, now we're looking really good for these intros. It was just a couple of um, performance reviews on the side there really kind of highlighted to me that I need to get my game back on track. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, yeah, performance in training in the heat, super, super relevant because it is hot. I think it's the first day in Brisbane where I'm from where it's cracked over 30 degrees, oh, wow. and not even November yet. So obviously going to be a very, very hot summer out here, which is very lovely and it's awesome to train in, but there are a lot of considerations you need to take into account when you are training in the heat. And that's what Loz and I are going to go over today. For sure. And even if you're kind of just listening to this intro, like, hmm, is this podcast for me? Kind of just clicked on it because I'm such a loyal follower to the potty. Um, this information is probably going to be relevant to you if one, you live and therefore train in hot conditions or two, you live in a colder um, climate, but you're actually going to be competing or traveling to a really hot place to, to train and or compete. Or the third one, like Jordy just said, you live in the Southern hemisphere and summer is coming and you need to get better at dealing with the heat because I don't know what it is, but literally everybody will always make a comment like, oh my gosh, that was so hard or it's going to be really hot. Therefore my session's going to be so much harder. And, you know, in this podcast today, we're going to break down why we kind of make those associations and why sometimes exercise does actually feel harder when it's hot. Because while we all respond differently to heat, ultimately the our human body, we all kind of respond in the same way at that physiological level in terms of how we deal with heat and, and the things that are going on inside our body to try and cool us down. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, and I think it's important to note too, it's not just relevant for endurance athletes that's what me and laws talk about a lot but all athletes right like mma athletes rugby athletes soccer athletes like anyone that does any sport where you're exposed to a hot environment that doesn't even have to be if you're out in the field like i remember playing rugby and you're out in the field and when you're in the beaming sun like obviously you feel that difference but when i've been doing jujitsu and say you're in a hot room and there's not good airflow when you're in there in the summer you're just your body temperature just skyrockets you sweat so much more so Every athlete who is exposed to any type of increased heat will benefit from hearing this. That's a really good point because yes, we do often talk specifically to endurance sports when we're on the podcast, but you know, as well, when we talk about training in the heat, it doesn't just mean you're training in the middle of the day under beaming sunlight. It could be, yeah, you're in a gym with crap conditioning. If you're a CrossFit athlete, 99% chance you don't have an air con or a fan in your gym. So it's going to start getting super hot. Or again, if you live, I don't know, in a tropical climate and when you're training at seven o'clock at night, it's still really hot. Um, this podcast is for you and hopefully we can help you to understand why your body is responding the way it does during heat and what you can do in a way to try and get better at coping with it. Um, Jordi, I suppose we should probably start off by doing a little crash course on temperature regulation and how our body regulates temperature. What do you think? Yeah, that, that's good. And there's a cool term here. I want you to go over endotherm. What does that mean? For sure. So we're all endotherms. Actually, everybody listening to this, unless you happen to be a snake and you're listening, uh, you're actually cold blooded. But um, what an endotherm means is that we're warm blooded. So all of us have naturally warm blood and our body loves balance. And as such, our body works really hard to try and maintain our internal core body temperature around 36, 37 degrees. So just for reference, you know, during COVID, everyone was putting thermometers at your head and beeping. And that's because during, you know, when you're sick, typically you're core body temperature will increase. So um, typically a healthy body temp around 36, 37 degrees. And thermoregulation, which is our body's ability to regulate temperature, is a huge part of maintaining homeostasis. And you know, people might've heard that before, but it's ultimately just our body trying to, to maintain like a constant environment within our body so that we can continue to live and thrive. Um, and our body is very clever. We detect sensors and changes, you know, through our skin, we can tell. Um, and ultimately, there's a big message center in our brain called the hypothalamus. And this receives messages from around the body um, to kind of signal to us if it's hot, cold, changes in temperature, all those types of things. And whether it's hot or cold, our body will um, send different signals to cause different reactions. But today, we're talking about heat only. So 
we're just going to focus on that one. And ultimately, if we start to get too hot, we can feel that that temperature is rising. Our hypothalamus sends signals to our body via the nervous system to do a few different things in order to maintain our body temperature. So one of those, and probably the biggest one when we're talking about the heat, is sweat. So when we start to heat up and our body recognises that, you know, we need to cool down in some way, we have increased sweat production. And what this is, is obviously liquid that's secreted from glands um, onto our skin surface. And what this does is it takes the heat out of our body and it's evaporated into the air. So ultimately sweating works by, um, sweating cools us down, sorry, by evaporation. So it's pretty cool to think, you know, our body has this process that we secrete water onto our skin and then the air sucks it up and we're cool. So ultimately sweat carries heat away um, from our body. And as a result, it also takes some fluid with us, um, which we will talk about later, but again, can lead to dehydration because sweating, losing fluid, we need fluid in our body. Um, however, the rate at which this sweat evaporates can be severely influenced by things such as our external environment, such as the temperature and also air movement. So what I mean by this, and I think it's important for people to understand is that if you're, say we're running, right? If you're running in a really humid kind of still environment, your sweat is very similar to the environment around you and it's probably not going to evaporate as quickly. And that's why when you're in a really humid environment, you know, it feels sticky, you just feel sweaty all the time and it's a really suffocating type of heat. And for all of those people that just participated in Kona, you know, watching a few vlogs and everything, it came up so often that they were just so hot and so humid and they were just always dripped in sweat. And that's because your body really struggles for that sweat to, to leave your skin when the conditions are like that. However, if you're running in say like a dry environment or maybe you've got a really nice kind of headwind coming, that's going to help facilitate that sweat loss and therefore cool you, have a more effective um, kind of cooling effect in terms of that sweat is actually properly evaporating off you. Yeah, I think a cool point to add there is when we talk about sweating and, and why it's so important to understand, I always use the example that humans are the most efficient sweaters in all of the animal kingdom. And the, the evolutionary theory of why that is, is that when we were in the savannas of Africa, we would literally run after our prey. Like we were endurance athletes back then and we would run after our prey. And the theory was that because humans got so good at this sweat, this thermoregulation and sweating process, because we could cool ourselves more efficiently by doing what Loz is saying, by putting sweat on our skin, and then endothermically evaporating it off and give that word endothermic a uh, Google if you want to understand what that means and why that makes us cool. But we could do that more efficiently than the buffalo or the gazelle or whatever it was that we were chasing. And that animal eventually, after however many kilometers or miles of running, which is overheat, and we'll talk about all the negative impacts of what happens when you overheat and it would drop down and we eventually catch up to it and then we would hunt and eat it. And if we put that back in the modern day and we'll talk about it, nowadays you see there's a lot when you're out in races, especially if you're running in the summer, you see a lot of these gazelles or whatever when we're out running on our footpaths, right? Like you see people overheating and you see all of these same functions, like you see a deterioration in their performance, even though they're going out for a casual run. And it's very, very interesting. And it all comes back to how our body regulates our body heat. And the way that humans do it is by sweating. And in all of the animal kingdom, we are by far the most efficient at that. Very pleased to hear that we are the most elite species on the planet in terms of uh, sweating. And we're probably also the only ones on the planet that also have deodorant for that exact purpose. So I suppose it makes sense. Um, and, you know, we all, like you just mentioned, someone you knows different people out there running. Um, the amount of sweat that we would lose is very individual. And, you know, yourself, Geordie, would have a different sweat rate to what I would, to what an elite athlete would, to you know, everyone sweats differently. Um, and But it's not uncommon for people to lose up to a litre of sweat per hour, which if you think, you know, you're out there maybe for five hours or something, that's quite a lot to be lost. And just because I was interested and I found it when I was kind of prepping for this podcast, but um, the highest apparently sweat rate reported is 3.7 litres in an hour. And that was by someone that was participating in the Olympic marathon quite a few years ago. But that's pretty hectic to think, 3.7 litres lost in one hour. Not sure how they measured that, but that can give you a bit of an understanding into how much fluid our body is capable of losing when it's hot and trying to regulate temperature. Yeah, I mean, like, I guess my initial response was to go, wow, but now that I'm thinking of it, I definitely have athletes that I've done, say, weight cutting with. 
And, and that's even in a bit of a dehydrator. If we've water loaded them properly, they're still dehydrated. But I've had athletes lose three liters in an hour. It's mm. a big one when your weight cutting is about two and a half. I think for the average human, you're probably not going to get up to that. And the average athlete, you're probably going to sit anywhere between half a liter, a liter. And then once you get above to the higher end, it's probably 1.5 to two. Anything yeah. above three, that's a, that's a crazy high sweat rate. It is. But in saying that as well, it's important to state, and I know, Jordy, you've mentioned it um, on the podcast before, and I'll get your take after I've made this comment. But, you know, I just said we can lose up to an hour a litre. But as exercise continues and as we become more dehydrated, whether that's from inadequate fluid intake coming in and or excessive sweat loss, so we're losing too much fluid, our sweat can become quite thick due to a losing our um, plasma and due to a decreased blood volume, which then can reduce our sweat output and also, you know, gradually over the time, we lose less fluid. So yes, okay, maybe we might start losing a litre per hour, but as our body heats up and maybe we're becoming dehydrated, our body is becoming less effective at regulating temperature because we don't have as much water in our body to also lose. So, you know, Jordi, I'll get you to go into this because I think you're extremely good at explaining it. I remember from a previous podcast, but just to remind yourselves that, you know, hydration really is so important because, our body is not the same from first hour to the seventh hour of exercise. We, we're continually changing. And if we don't have enough water in there to lose, okay, we might become, you know, ex, like extreme heat stress because we don't actually have the potential to, to try and regulate our temperature through things such as sweating. Yeah, it's an important concept to understand. I'll go into it. But the reason why you need to understand it is because overheating and dehydration are so intricately linked. So if you think about everything Loz just said there, is that the way that our body regulates our core body temperature and regulates this excessive heat. And remember, we're producing heat, not only just being outside and having the sun shine on us, but when we're working out and we're contracting our muscles, we're producing heat in there. So we've got that internal heat. The body has a lot of it to deal with and a lot of it to get rid of. And the way that it does that is by circulating blood around our body and pushing the fluid, or we call it the plasma volume from our blood onto our skin and that's where we see that sweat and it's that sweat evaporating now there's a few points you need to be mindful of here for your body to cool that sweat needs to evaporate which is a big consideration when we're talking about in the heat like Loz was saying if you've got still air around you and say this you see this a lot say if you see people running in the gym on a treadmill and this has definitely happened to me when I've done long runs on there you see dripping sweat and you would have walked past and you see this in the sauna as well when guys are cutting weight they just drip, 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 drip. And that's not necessarily a great sign because it shows that that sweat is not evaporating and that all they're doing is losing fluid from their blood, from that plasma volume, and they're not effectively cooling. So they're getting more dehydrated, but not getting the cooling effect. This is why you see many athletes say if they're riding a bike inside or running inside on a treadmill, they stick a fan in front of them. They stick a fan to get that air to circulate because that helps encourage that evaporation and so yes you are becoming more dehydrated you're losing but at least you're cooling and you're putting off that effect of overheating and the way that works and why that becomes so problematic in the long term like Loz said as you keep losing fluid your body really 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 wants to protect the fluid in your blood which makes a lot of sense because fluid in your blood is supplying all the oxygen all the nutrients around your body to your working muscle but there will be a point and we call it the critical point where your body isn't going to give up any more fluid from your blood because it needs it and it's going to get thicker. So it starts shifting fluid from the inner parts, the deeper parts of your body. What really happens, it's called an osmotic pressure. So when your body gets to a certain point of dehydration where you lose enough fluid out of your blood, there's an osmotic pressure, which just means a difference in concentration gradients of all the electrolytes and different fluid compartments that push more fluid, more water from deep inside your body into your blood so your body can keep circulating. And which is really good because then you can keep circulating blood around, you can keep cooling yourself. Problem is, is now that you've lost fluid from those deeper parts in your body, which is further going to contribute to this dehydration. And then once we get to a certain level of dehydration, we see we really struggle with overheating and we really struggle with managing that heat. And that heat can have some real negative effects on physical performance. That was a good explanation, Jordy. Thanks so much for that. And I think hopefully a lot of listeners kind of had that, oh, aha moment as well when you said, 
you know, when you're in a gym and you're on a treadmill or you're on a bike where you don't have that air circulating, yes, of course you're sweating, but that sweat's just dripping on the floor. It's not necessarily evaporating. And even though I know this, you know, you still kind of make, you just forget to make that correlation that even myself, when I'm on the wind trainer, I'm not even working as hard as I would be on the road, yet my sweat is just dripping everywhere. And it's because, okay, yes, I'm sweating, but it's not going anywhere. It's just kind of dripping onto the floor and making a mess. So good reminder for those of you listening to this, if you are having long sessions on the wind trainer and or training inside, you know, chuck a fan on, whether you've got a ceiling fan or one in front of you, I think that's a really good little tip. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And even if you are inside, crank the aircon on, right? Like at the end of the day, if you can decrease the, the overall temperature, which you'll still, you'll still obviously by working out, increase your core body temperature and start overheating, but it will make it a lot easier if you're in a cooler environment. So not everyone has uh, access to be honest. I, I don't find me, unless I'm in a hotel gym or something yeah. when we're traveling, like I, I, I'm i trying to think, yeah, I was like, I don't want to sound too like pritzy, but like my, my gym and our apartment building, yeah, we have aircon, but, <laughs> but yeah. most gyms yeah, you go most to, most recreational gyms do as well. Yeah. Yeah, most rugged gyms that you go to, like CrossFit gyms, my jiu-jitsu gym, my MMA gym, most of them, my weightlifting gym, they don't have aircon. That's yeah, that's definitely exactly. going to be a problem. Crank a fan on if you're in there. Yeah, for sure. And I think another way our body regulates temperature, which you kind of alluded to, I think, Geordie, is um, our blood. So what happens to our blood vessels? And it's called vasodilation. And ultimately, when we're hot, the blood vessels, so the vessels in our body that carry blood everywhere, um, they actually dilate, so they get larger. Um, so that they can pass more heat to our skin to then leave our body. So this is often why we get really red when we're exercising. And that's because those blood vessels close to the skin are spreading out. We've got a greater surface area so that our body can pass that heat through. And again, instead of evaporating this time, it's called convection, losing heat through convection. It sounds like we're talking about ovens now. However, our body is pretty clever and we can regulate our temperature through multiple different ways. But the predominant ones here are sweat, and also vasodilation. So again, that's increased cardiac output, which we'll talk about soon. Yeah, and I think um, let's start talking about what you need to do when you are training. So, so let's say we have an athlete, well, every athlete down in the Southern Hemisphere and all of New Zealand, everywhere else in the world, it's getting hot. We do train outside, it's so nice we're going to train. What are some things that we can do to make sure that we're coping with this heat? For sure. I think, um, as we've mentioned many, many, many times and spoken about in great de detail on our podcast, Jordi is staying on top of your hydration. And that is very, you know, general advice because everyone has different fluid and or, you know, salt requirements. However, you know, it's not always viable to replace 100% of what you lose. However, aim of the game here is to try and get as close to that as possible so that we're not having too much fluid loss through sweat um, and that we are staying hydrated. So of course, yes, water, but also accompanying that water with electrolytes, um, predominantly being sodium so that we can maintain fluid balance and, and help to keep that fluid in our body instead of just passing it straight through. So whether it's, you know, we've mentioned before, if you want to try and get a gauge of how much sweat you're losing, you know, weigh yourself before training, after training, try and think about anything that you have during, and that can help you to get that kind of number of, ooh, okay, how many liters did I lose in sweat today? So that you can make sure that you've got enough fluid with you during training and or replace afterwards. So I think one of the biggest ones, of course, yes, is staying on top of your hydration. But another big thing that's kind of not nutrition related would be heat acclimation, which, you know, for us in the combat sports world is, is a huge thing but it's actually not just important for our combat athletes. Yeah. And it's, it's growing so much more say in the endurance space. And I see it a lot. Athletes will do a brick session where they'll go for a ride and go for a run. And then straight after they'll jump in the hot tub and that's shown to have benefits because your body gets better physiologically at sweating. They get a faster onset of sweat. You lose more sweat per hour of time which means that you're better at handling that heat where the catch 22 with that is that you're losing more fluid. So you have to stay way more on top of your hydration. However, the benefit of being heat acclimated is that you're likely going to lose less electrolytes. So mm -hmm. you're, even if you're just putting in a bit of electrolytes, you can retain the fluid that you are putting back in, which can become a big problem as if you're getting really dehydrated and then you're trying to replace that fluid but you're not putting in adequate electrolytes and you see this all the time in races guys pulling up to the side every 20 minutes and they're peeing and then they subconsciously think oh yeah i'm doing really well like keeping on top it's like oh you kind of want that to be staying in your body you need to put those electrolytes in so you're staying in so um i think yeah heat acclimation is something that all athletes who do any type of training or competing in the heat if you're not regularly 
training outside or in a hot environment, say you only have access to like your air conditioned gym that you're in every single day, then it's probably worthwhile to do some heat acclimation training. If you are outside and you're running on the track or you've got sessions in like a really grungy gym and you are quite hot, you will get the natural benefits of heat acclimation. That will just occur as a physiological effect of being in the heat. So you don't have to do additional sessions on top of that. But I think um, we spoke about what you do to, to stop it. I think I wanted to touch on that first before we talk about what happens to the guys that stuff this up because it's really serious. Like if, if you get overheating and you get you know, mild heat stroke and you experience this, if anyone's gone through it or seen people in races or whatever go through it, it's really not good. So yeah, Loz, talk us through what actually happens to the body or our performance when we go through this. For sure, yeah. And as we kind of was speaking about with the sweat in terms of, you know, the more dehydrated we become, the less fluid and the less blood plasma that we have. So our blood becomes quite viscous, which means it's quite thick. And if our body is trying to pump, you know, this thick blood, through our arteries and through our body to supply oxygen to our working muscles. That adds a lot of strain on our heart. Our heart is the big muscle in our chest that loves to pump that blood around. And what we call this is ultimately, you know, increased cardiac output. And as a result of that, you might notice if you've got, you know, Garmin on or a smartwatch, you, your heart rate's probably going to start to increase and, and that perception of effort is going to increase. So, you know, before we talk about some other factors, I think realizing that, okay, well, as you become more dehydrated and you're losing fluid, Yes, of course, you're becoming dehydrated, which everyone's aware of, and you might feel faint, lightheaded, all those types of things. But, but the strain that that's putting on your cardiac, uh, on your, your cardiovascular system is, is huge, trying to push this thick blood through our body. And it also results in sometimes, you know, less oxygen being delivered to our muscles as effectively. And all of these things as well are contributing to that fatigue that you feel, maybe feeling lightheaded, um, that increased perception of effort. And it's really easy to associate those symptoms purely with losing water. But it's okay, understanding that why we feel like this is because our blood ultimately is starting to get a bit thicker from not having as much fluid in. Um, so that, that's a huge thing. And again, as well, um, our body produces byproducts when we're creating energy, you know, breaking down, say, glycogen or, or fatty acids to produce energy. And ultimately, every process in our body kind of creates a little bit of heat. Um, but something that's been shown to happen during the heat is increased plasma in our blood. Um, and that's due to we've got less oxygen floating around. If anyone remembers from a previous podcast, we've spoken about aerobic metabolism and anaerobic metabolism. Um, aerobic metabolism is when you've got oxygen present and anaerobic metabolism is when you don't have oxygen present. Um, and lactate or lactic acid is, is a byproduct of that anaerobic system. Um, and when we are feeling great heat stress and we don't have you know, as much oxygen traveling to the body, our system, even if we trained really well, we might start shifting over to that anaerobic side and as a result, we've got increased plasma in our bloods because um, we've got that decreased um, oxygen to our muscles. And that can also build that kind of heavy feeling in our legs. Again, feeling fatigued, feeling tired. Um, another one as well, you know, speaking about metabolism is actually the shift in energy metabolism that can occur under heat stress, which is quite interesting. And I did like a little bit of research before this podcast just to kind of find out and, you know, consolidate the facts. But um, quite a lot of studies actually found that increase um an increase in muscle glycogen utilization and decreased fat um, concentration so for example again highlighting that we've got a greater carbohydrate use over fat for energy because again we don't have that oxygen in our system and, and breaking down fats often requires having a bit more oxygen and, and working at a slower pace so as we become dehydrated from heat stress our perception of effort is increased you know we're having to work harder with less oxygen on board our metabolism is also shifting and um, again, yeah, increased use of that muscle glycogen is attributed to the increase in anaerobic glycolysis as a result of no oxygen present. So, you know, we've got a greater reliance on glycogen. And if you maybe didn't fuel up properly or you haven't fueled properly during your training, you're going to say hit the wall sooner than normal because your body is relying so heavily on breaking down your glycogen stores or, or any circulating blood glucose that's, um, that's flowing through your body. So again, placing a greater demand on energy um, when we are under heat stress. Yeah, a great way a doctor, a sports doctor put it to me once was you need to remember that heat in the body can denature proteins. Like if we are exposed to too much heat, it can literally denature the proteins that make our body. So when you're thinking about heat illness, heat stroke or overheating, 
you need to appreciate that it's a huge stress on the system. It's a huge stress and every single bodily system is affected to one degree or another. And no, no body system escapes it. Like Lords is saying that even if you're doing mild to moderate exercise where you would normally be in a very aerobic zone or, you know, well below your, your, your aerobic threshold, all of a sudden, if you're overheating, you could push up into those areas where you're above the threshold. And then all of a sudden you're using these carbohydrates, you're producing more plasma lactate, you're feeling more tired than what you normally would. And then all of a sudden this easy run isn't no longer an easy run. You're building up lactate, you're producing that hydrogen ion that causes that acidic heavy feeling that we all feel you're getting all these metabolic byproducts all of a sudden your heart rate goes through the roof because we're de becoming dehydrated our cardiac output is increasing and, and a way to stabilize that is our heart rate has to go up to match the the losing fluid and to keep that stroke volume the thing is is that a lot of people don't appreciate that and this is why you see in a lot of races when you when you come in around even if people are going slower or something you see them with like ice right like there's a really popular thing now is that they get those ice hats and it's an, it's an attempt to stop overheating and this is why it's so 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 important and so important that you're you're smart if you're going out and you're training in a hot environment even if you are on top of your hydration like you can very very much so be on top of your hydration and get your fluid in but still be exposed to direct sunlight and not getting shade and still experience an increase in core body temperature you will still be sweating and even if you are meeting the demands of that sweat loss your body can still be overheated so you need to be very aware of this and you need to do your due diligence and do things that we were talking about to help to help yourself deal with these and cope with uh training in the heat or competing in the heat and do things like heat acclimation. So if you are in that environment and you can't get away from it, help your body be better at it. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, you know, just listening to this, whether you go away and change anything that you do or not, understanding why maybe, okay, you know, you went on holiday and you were trying to go for a run and your heart rate was no higher than normal or you just felt like it was so hard and all you were doing was, you know, something that would relatively be relatively easy for you. You know, when you understand this and you understand the strain that heat has on our body, I think it also just helps you to understand better or like to interpret your results or if you're reflecting on your training it's not okay I lost fitness overnight it's okay my body is trying to respond here to the heat and um you know I experienced that firsthand when I was in Mount Isa at the beginning of the year northwest Queensland 42 degrees on a good day trying to just even go for a 4k run or when I was at CrossFit my heart rate was you know up to 200 sometimes and I'm just this is ridiculous you know I'm not unfit but the strain that that intense heat had on my body was it took me so long to get used to but on the plus side you know speaking about heat acclimation I know for a fact that it works because when I came home and I was training I felt so good you know everything kind of just felt a little bit easier and in a way it's almost like altitude training but for the heat I mean you know just for, for those people that are you know have a huge race coming up or a huge event in a really hot um, climate or a whole country something that's really different to where you are if you have the resources the time and the money to get there earlier um, you know, it's, it's something that can really help you to adapt and also to, to feel good on the day because it, it definitely can take it out of you if you're not used to the heat. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. I think if we're going to leave the guys with the top tips, so I think mm -hmm. some of the negative things that can happen if we are training and we're exposed to this heat, physical performance, we're obviously going to shift and we're going to use more of that glycogen where we probably would be using fat, those easy runs where we predominantly burned fat we're probably going to eat into glycogen we're going to eat switch over, switch over to our anaerobic system which is going to produce that lactate we're going to produce that hydrogen ion so we're going to be feeling heavy mm -hmm. feeling a bit more fatigued that's completely normal if you're experiencing this again there's also that extra heat stress on our heart our cardiovascular system like was the same it's very normal for your heart rate to go through the roof I think for anyone doing this, ease into it, right? Like ease into training in the heat. Don't expect to go and go balls deep and jump in. I remember coming back from, I think I was in Canada over Christmas last year and I came back to Melbourne and there was an 80 degree Celsius, 80 degrees Celsius difference. I was yeah, in negative was 40 to plus 40. And I remember going out for a 10K run and I think I lasted probably three kilometers and I turned around and walked home and then just sat in a cold <laughs> shower. And it was just, it was horrible. So you have to slowly ease yourself into it. Ways that you can do that, obviously we're talking about 
gradually build up if you if you're used to running 10ks just wind it back put your ego to the side you can still get the good adaptations good training benefits use a cool room if you can if you've got access to a gym that has a treadmill or whatever with air conditioning use that if you're doing it at home or wherever make sure you got a fan to help evaporate that sweat to make sure that you're effectively cooling you can get really good clothing you can get um wicker clothing that can help evaporate that process it doesn't just you, everyone knows when you get those shirts, they just feel logged and heavy, but you can get really good workout shirts that help evaporate that sweat. Again, using things like ice and slushies and things like super dupers if you're out for extended period of time and you can take like an esky or something. And then obviously being on top of your hydration, making sure you're staying on top of the fluid and the electrolytes, making sure you're staying adequately hydrated is going to be your best bet of dealing with the heat. That's awesome. Yeah, good summary, Jordy. And I think let summer begin for those of us down in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, bring it on. I'm glad I'm going back over to North America for a while the next couple of <laughs> months, to be honest, because it always yeah. makes you, like you said, Lodz, it always makes you feel better because I always train for a bit here in the heat and then mm-hmm. I always go over there and then you just smash PBs and you got to remember that. You got to come back to the stinking hot weather that is home. It's a kind of temporary confidence boost. Yeah, that's it. All right, Lodz, until next time. Thanks, Jordy.